I'll just, are we ready to we're recording, Reese? Yeah? yeah? Cool. Um, so I'll start it and then we'll get going. So, when, big welcome, and here's it down and get on with it. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Math Brown podcast. Please welcome my guest for today, Mr. James Acaster. <laughs> It's been a good start already. It was three laughs and you've only just sat down. <laughs> well done for not breaking a chair. Al Murray broke the chair last week. Did he? Yeah. That's a shame. I know. But it started well. Well, what happened? Was it with the chair broken anyway? No. <laughs> you just sat down and it broke. That is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. But it started a good podcast. Yeah. Anyway, so thanks very much for coming, James. Now, straight away, we've got to talk about your Netflix um, experience. Because well first, right? Well first, releasing four hours at once. Yes. <laughs> Are you going to be like that today? Are you just well put an answer? I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, yes, it is a world first. Yeah. And tell, tell me how that came about. Uh, I kind of forced it to happen, really. It wasn't like a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people online who uh, don't like the shows um, are furious <laughs> that Netflix gave me four shows. As if it's like, that's how it happened. As if like they were like, we're, we're going to, you know, they were giving Ricky Gervais a special and paying him. $40 million or whatever it was that you got, and James Acaster, you can have four, let's say, and pay the same amount for each one. Right. But that's not how it happened. Uh, like, I, I just decided last year that I, the next thing I wanted to do was film a, sh a show. Or, well, it was always going to be three shows, and I, I wanted to do that, and I wanted that to be the only thing that I did last year, and that was the main thing I wanted to achieve. And I could have just told my agents, that's what we're doing this year. Yeah. And um, then... I kind of had to really push for it to happen um, and assemble my own kind of crew of people that I like and have worked with before who haven't done, you know, comedy specials before that have gone out on any, you know, platform. They're, they're kind of, they've done some like small ones, but they haven't done anything like this and uh, they're people that I've just worked with and I knew could do a really good job. And we were just going to film it and put it on my website and lose a lot of money on it. I was gonna, you know, my, my agents at the time, they're not making us anymore, but like at the time, they were gonna, they were gonna, uh, they were gonna put... Let me just write that out yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they were gonna, they were gonna put... Agents. <laughs> they, they were gonna put some, quite a lot of money into it, and I was gonna put a lot of my own money into it as well, and we were just gonna have it as download on the website. And I think because that was the situation, they really, really started working hard on trying to find a place to sell it to because right. they were like oh we're about to lose quite a lot of money um, so they tried going around all the different channels uh, in Britain and they all said no because they said he's he's never done a special before which is absolutely understandable as well they all went he's never filmed a comedy special before and you ask us if you want to buy three of them <laughs> and they're like yeah yeah and then like later on it became four yeah. so uh, they're like oh yeah things are making it an easier pitch yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we're now doing four aren't we so um, and I just kind of kept on you know pushing it it was probably quite a difficult client last year for my agents in that respect I was just kind of going we're going to do this and you know this is the weekend we've got to film it because they booked a tour in so that I relearned them all mm. which started in January uh, end of January and went all the way through to the end of Edinburgh in August and you did and three nights you did three consecutive nights in each yeah I'd go to each place and do three nights in each venue and then on to the next place and just do a different show every night and when I came up with the idea for the fourth show the final night was two shows with an interval in the middle um, I was just doing them and so I was rewriting them and changing them and honing them and I was like there's no like if we don't film these shows this is a really stressful year right. so I was like we have to get a date in to film them I was like it has to be the week after Edinburgh so we booked it in I think it was the 9th or the 10th of September we did it in the end and so I had to book it in there and at this point we still had no one who was going to buy it and it was just going to be yeah again like we were putting all this money into it to put it on my website for download and um my agents in my British agents and my American agents both work yeah, yeah. really hard. Yeah, <laughs> very successful, man. And, uh, <laughs> and they they both really you know uh, chased Netflix on it. Netflix has like shown some kind of 
vague interest, which is more than anyone else had shown. Mm -hmm. So we really kind of like went after them. And basically, it was kind of the way it came about is that we said, you know, you know, you, all these other specials you're spending this much for like one show. We figured out a way that we can film all, all four shows for the price of one. And if you want, you can just pay us what it costs. And like, uh, so a lot of people think I'm loaded. <laughs> I've made nothing. Really? Yeah. Because it's like, well, I've made something, but like yeah. a little bit, yeah, yeah. but not much. Because <laughs> um, that was never the idea. That was never like the, the point was is that I want to film these shows and we're doing exactly. And also, that gave us a lot more leeway, a lot more freedom to do what we wanted because, you know, they were just <laughs> giving us chump change for four shows. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, and I've heard that they're really easy to work with anyway, but they were easy to work with. <laughs> <laughs> and we were sending them stuff, and they were like, ah, oh, uh, it gives notes. And the first load of notes, they said, um, you know, there's a mic stand in the way of the camera, this shot, and it goes out of focus a bit here, and there's a light flare here. And the editor replied, going, oh, yeah, these are deliberate choices. James Wood wants it to feel like that. And they went, okay, ignore that. Usually, they push back, people push back, or they make you do stuff. They, they floated the idea. They said, could it be 45 minutes an episode? And we said, no, this is kind of as short as we can get them. And they went, yeah, okay, fine. And, then, and that was the whole thing. I was like, every time. At one point, they said to us, um, a later stage of notes, they went, oh, there's a point here where the camera wobbles really wildly. Obviously, if that's an artistic decision, just keep in. And we went, it's not, that's a genuine mistake, but you're going to let us keep that shit in. <laughs> that's genuinely shit. <laughs> and you're going to let us do it. Um, but, uh, so they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were really supportive throughout it as well and, and uh, really encouraging and made us feel like we were on the right track as well, which is, which is great. But yeah, it kind, of, it kind of came about because we figured out a way of doing it that would, would mean that we can just... I, I, went to, I filmed them all in four days, all in one day, sorry. All in so, one day? Yeah, so I did all in one day, and then I did them all the next day again for safety. So I did, okay. um, all four in a day, and then all four the next day. Same audience? No, it was the uh, same audience for the first two shows, and then about half of them went home, and uh, another load of people came in, and the, second, and the afternoon was that audience, the same audience for those two shows. Right. And then you know, the next day, different load of people completely. Um, so yeah, there's always like half of them had seen all four, and uh, the other half in the final show, which has a lot of callbacks to the other shows, was sitting there like, why is everyone laughing at that? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It's interesting that uh, when you said that nobody was interested in, in having them in the first place, because the three shows you were putting around had all been uh, nominated for the Perry Award. It's called the fucking Perry Award, not, yep, not the absolutely. Award. And it's the, there still was just no interest in it. That's incredible. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that award means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it means a lot so, of the people that want it. Uh, I don't know. I know a few of the people who want it. I don't think they really? that much to it. Yeah. Who do you think that is, or don't you want to say? No, no, I don't think they'd be ashamed of it. They're, they're comedians who are doing comedy for the love of comedy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the award doesn't mean that much to them. I'd probably say all of them, yeah. to be honest. All, 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 all the comedians I know who have won it, uh, who, you know, won it when I was nominated, and they haven't gone around afterwards like, this is it, I fucking did it. Yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 like, they're like, okay, fine, on to the next show. And, like, you know, they're just very... Good comics. It, it doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? Because like no. 15 years ago, if you got if you got nominated, or well, no, if you won it, then you pretty much got your pick of what channel you go on and you get your own show and you do what you want with it. Right. Yeah. Whereas now it's just right. It's another show to do tomorrow. Yeah, people don't. I don't know. Like, I think I, I, I've had meetings with telly people where they are unaware that I've even been to Edinburgh before. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Just going. Oh, have you been to Edinburgh? Fucking yeah, hell. six times. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm like, how, how'd they go? Like, Fuck it. Fuck you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of like you just realise that doesn't really mean much to them. That that final week, this telly week, you know, the amount of us comics who have bumped into telly people in the street who yeah. have hammered on their way to see a show, yeah. and you're like, oh, good. Well, I mean, I assume you got a comp to that show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you're going to put that person in a TV show no matter what now. Because yeah. you're about to not see a show that, that they've paid for you to see. So I really hope you're going to do something with them. Yeah. Um, but like, so yeah, no, that kind of, like, Edinburgh and stuff, um, yeah, the awards don't mean anything and stuff like that. All that means something is working your show, becoming a better comedian, building your audience. All the reasons why you got into stand-up in the first place 
are always the reasons. Yeah. Like, all the things that we kind of, like, catch as we go on that become important because other people say they are, uh, are just not. But you have to learn that properly. I think there was a whole stage where I was, like, acting like... um. Because you get to... When you first start going to Edinburgh, you're just excited to go to Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. But then, quite prematurely, actually, all the other comics who like are coming up at the same time as you start acting like, oh, no, I've got to go to Edinburgh. And it's just because they've seen other comics do it and speak like that. <laughs> so then we all speak like it. Yeah, We're yeah. in the early doors. <laughs> like, you go to Edinburgh this year, oh, Jesus. I'm just trying to... I don't, I'm not reading reviews. I'm not doing it. Yeah. speak like that. And it's like... Actually, no, you're, we're all excited about it still. And you need to go through that to then... You need to care about it to learn that it's not important. Yeah. You need to learn that reviews don't matter the hard way, not the easy way. Well, yeah, I, think, I agree with that, because um, uh, when you're talking about the TV producer being drunk going to a show, I had a guy from GQ magazine who was trying to compile the top ten list of, of shows to go and see. Yeah. And within probably about six minutes, he was absolutely leather. In six minutes, he was asleep in my show. Yeah. Still made the top ten. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, should, I should hope so. <laughs> and when you're putting a show together, because these, because um, I saw you, you first the show you got nominated for the first year, uh, that week, you know when you get nominated, mm. those shows that I saw the day you got nominated. Right. Is that a different experience for the audience then? Uh, it can be, but I, actually, it kind of the first time it was because the first time I've been performing in a porter cabin to like. <laughs> Very few people every day. Right. It was right. the year of the Olympics, so it's 2012. Yeah. And uh, some days I had like under 10 people, and some days it was like, you know, half full or whatever. But like, and I remember one day being full, and it was because everyone else had a day off. So <laughs> and I um, just died on my ass to a room full of people who wanted to see someone else. Um, and then, like, yeah, on the day that that got nominated, I remember walking out and it was full and go doing the. And I. I mean, if it's the same one you're talking about, I, I kind of <laughs> ruined that show by laughing all the time because I kept on remembering I've been nominated. You kept on saying, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You kept on saying you're thinking, this guy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 because I was shit. Because <laughs> I just couldn't deliver the show because I was just in a good mood and I kind of had to say, I'm really sorry, guys, I've had a very good day. And I can't really do this. Because, like, was it full of comics? I mean, I've I seem to remember seeing a few. Maybe. I, don't I think know. it's just what happens is when you get nominated, all the comics that haven't been nominated go and watch all those shows to come out and go, I don't see why that got fucking nominated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that the shows that do get nominated are like, you know, it's all subjective anyway. Yeah. Uh, any, any bunch of shows we get, it's just like however many people on that panel and their own taste in comedy, and it's just completely random. And yeah. the shows that do get nominated, compared to the ones that do, you know, even if you do prefer them, it's usually by a hair. Mm. It's not like, that's so infinitely better than everything else. It's like, we're all going up and trying really hard, and there's a lot of good shows on the fringe. So, uh, yeah, when people do go and see it, because it got nominated, you expect it to be this otherworldly experience. It's like, I'm going to laugh so much, and then I'm going to think and cry, and I'm going to walk out, and my life will have changed. It's like, mm. oh, it's just a funny comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where's next? Um, can I talk to you about when you put a show together? It's always get a bit technical. Um, no, do you, because I've been watching you, because you've been doing, you've got about 40 minutes now, have you, for the ne- next one? Yeah, no, but it, you know, it's like an accordion that keeps getting yeah, bigger and smaller. Yeah, it comes and goes. So talk me through day one. Day one, you, you finish that editor, but you're starting another show. Mm. Talk me through the process. Uh, just book all the gigs, just book a load of new material nights in, and uh, gives you a deadline. Yeah. So you've got, you know, got a gig in a month or whatever it is, and you go, I've got to have something for that. I can't go on stage and say the old stuff again because I can't stand to hear it. <laughs> and, um, and then, yeah, I guess, like, first of all, accept the fact it's going to be shit and that uh, uh, it's going to take ages to get it where you want it, that you're going to have to so, fail how, for Say ages, time. say ages. How long would you say ages is? Well, it's never finished. So, like, you know, when I relearned these old shows, I was like, oh, they still need work doing to them. And they, they, they were shows that I'd written, done in Edinburgh, done on tour, stopped touring them, and I was picking them up again and going, oh, it's still not. It's still going to be better, so I'm still going to change it. So, like, uh, but it will take, it'll take until, I don't know, maybe take until Edinburgh or a bit before for, for, to be comfortable having people paying to see it. <laughs> you know, people like, paying a certain amount of money to see it, obviously. Yeah. You know, previews and stuff is fine, but like, yeah, like over, they're paying over, I don't know, nine quid 
<laughs> then I'd, I'd like to feel like it's worth it for them. Right. So, uh, do you start with a concept, or you just literally start with ideas? All different, really. So, like, a lot of shows just started with ideas, um, and then I'd start with like a bit of a. I think from 2014 onwards, when I did, I did a show in 2014 about being an undercover cop for the yeah. whole show, <laughs> and. Uh, those of you who haven't seen me before, that's a very swift introduction. But there you go. Uh, but, uh, well, what made you come up with that then? Pat, Pat Springleaf, was it? Pat yeah. Springleaf is an undercover cop. Yeah, I, I, um, I just wanted to do it. It was, I, I hated the year before in Edinburgh. I, I, the year before in Edinburgh was the last year where I'd sat down and written everything all the time and put myself through that stress. Right. And absolutely, just like, I couldn't do it. I was sitting down every day to write something and nothing would come and I'd be really stressed out and it would be like I was writing down puzzles because it was just like, well, this this and this is similar, so I'm going to make this the punchline. And, and it wasn't really how my mind worked. It was me trying to force my brain to be like a comedian. And I think it's because the year before, in 2012, my show had been a bit like that, a bit more kind of like logically made sense joke-wise. It, but it's because I toured with Milton Jones for a year, right. supporting him, and my brain started to naturally just work in the, that way. So it wasn't a huge effort for me to write a show like that anymore. It wasn't like, I didn't have to, well, it was still a huge effort, but I didn't have to sit down and make myself do it and to try and manipulate my uh, ideas into to fit that. But then the following year, I did you know I wasn't really thinking like that anymore, and I was trying to make myself think in that way, stressing myself out by sitting down to try and write it. And so the undercover cop thing was just because I was like, I never want to have that kind of stress again in a show. I never want to not enjoy a show. What do I want to talk about? I'm going to tell them I'm an undercover cop. And it was like it was, but it was literally that. It wasn't like this big thing of like. Oh, and if I say I'm an undercover cop, yeah. then I can make that a metaphor for this. And I can, it wasn't that at the beginning. It was just, oh, it'll be funny as a stand-up to be saying that I'm something that is completely a lie, and clearly they know it's a lie, and it's bollock, and the whole thing is so silly. Right. And I just thought it'd be fun for me, you know. And so I was just going on, and just saying it just for a laugh, and, to be, and, and then the more I did it, the more I was like, oh, any bit of material that I write make relative to the cop because I was just going to have one routine right. I was going to have like a little five minute bit or whatever where I said I was going to become a cop and then go back to being me and leave it at that but then every routine I wrote it was more fun if I added that layer on top of it gotcha yeah um, and I think at the time I was watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia a lot and I saw season seven is one of my favourite seasons of any sitcom because the guy who plays Mac uh, Rob McElhaney he's really fat for it or you put, you put on loads of weight for it right. and just it, so he goes from being this quite hench quite you know toned guy to just being really overweight and he grows really big beard and he's wearing Benny Harness shirts and it was just always funny when he was in a scene just to see him and go you're a comic actor in a sitcom and you did what Robert De Niro did in Raging Bull. Like, you, you've done that. And so, because that was always there, and, and also with, with that sitcom, um, uh, Danny DeVito just being there, it's always just funny that they've got Danny DeVito in that sitcom. So those things are just always funny without ever having to be jokes or reference in it. And I, I kind of felt a bit like that. Like, if I just, all of my routines in this show are just observational routines like I'd normally do, and silly jokes and stuff, but I'm an undercover cop all the time. <laughs> then that's funny for me to do, and that's more fun for me to do if I'm if I'm doing it with that just extra kind of like lens over it all the time. And then as it developed, it became more like, oh, actually, I remember speaking with Tony Law about uh, one of his shows. It's his 2012 show. We got nominated the same year. Right. I mean, uh, even us were expecting it, and we chatted about it a lot afterwards. And uh, he was saying how it had been the first show where he had kind of analysed why he was talking about the nonsense things he was talking about. Like, um, if you don't know Tony, he's an amazing, surreal comedian. He talks about stuff that, you know, flights and fancy don't always make sense. And, uh, you know, like, you know, being picked up by a moon cat and flying around the, the world and stuff like that. Like, you know, stuff that is nonsense. But that was the first show where he, he had kind of sat down with his wife and she had gone, almost like a psychiatrist, gone, right, Who's the moon cat though, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and him being like, I guess it's my dad. And then I'm like, like, figuring it out. And, um, and I just had that chat with him and thought it was interesting. And um, when I was doing the, the Undercover Cop show, I wasn't thinking like that. I wasn't yeah. trying to think, well, why are you saying you're an undercover? But then, like, um, I thought it would be, 
it was, it was an accident. I thought an element of being an undercover cop often in those films is that their wife leaves them or chucks them out of the house because they're getting obsessed with the case. Yeah. And so I thought I'll add that line in. And my girlfriend had genuinely broke up me at the time, and I was struggling to deal with it. And so I kind of just thought I can do this natural material I've got about a breakup. I could do it through this just saying it's my wife leaving me. Yeah. So I was, so I was just doing that, and then I realised, oh, this whole thing is about this because, like, I, you know, I did. I kind of didn't know who I was around that point. I felt like I felt like I was just pretending to be someone that I wasn't all the time. I had this big identity crisis that year, and simultaneously was writing about being an undercover cop and, <laughs> and pretending to be other people and not knowing who I was, and didn't put the two together. Right. And then, how like, did you put the two together? I think I was, I think it was as as always, as a chat with Nish Kumar in, uh, in in Melbourne, and we were just both talking about the ends of our shows that year. Yeah. We kind of like fixed each other's endings to our show, so I came up with an idea for his one, which became the ending of his show, and with my one, he was just like, well, this is what you're talking about, and he said, you kind of owe it to the audience to tell them at the end that you should end the show by explaining why they've just listened to you saying you're an undercover cop for now. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I was like, that seems fair. And so, yeah, it kind of became that, but they, that was very, you know, and uh, you know, it took a while to to put that one, to, well, yeah, it was just like a fun show, and then at the end it was like, oh, this was more than I thought it was. And then the second, the one after that was a bit more deliberate, but not as much. Mm. And then the third one was more from the start. The concept, yeah. I, just, I was like, I'm going to say I'm in witness protection. I'm going to say I'm about to go into witness protection, and that is a metaphor for how I always want to start my life again. I want to go to Kenya every time my comedy's going badly, <laughs> and I just knew it from the start. So it's going to be called Resex. They've all begun with re, and then that that fits with the theme. And it was like, and then that was like a week after Edinburgh yeah. on holiday. I just realising, oh, I guess I'll go back to Edinburgh next year. So they all come differently. And this one that I'm doing now, I'm just, you know, I didn't have a very nice year last year personally. Uh, you know, like, obviously filming the shows was great, but it was stressful. Like, if you watch those shows, just know that in between them, I was going backstage, putting my head in my hands and thinking, I don't know if I could go back on and do it again. <laughs> like, I was very stressed all year. And um, oh, mate, do you want to cuddle? Didn't have a great time, huh? Do you want to cuddle? Are you alright? No, I'm alright. But like, <laughs> some of us are more comfortable talking about our feelings than others. Clearly, math. Um, uh, Just wanted to help. That's, no, 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 that's, that's very sweet of you. Um, but I don't think the chair could take both of us. So. <laughs> I was talking to some talking to a friend of mine yesterday, describing, and uh, he described you as a, as a very left-handed comedian. And it sort of fitted straight away. I don't know, I don't know why or how. Right. But um, and I was reading about when you first started, you made a point of being different from everyone else. Is that right? Uh, kind of, yeah. It was, it was uh, I, I kind of, um, early on, I think I went into it as an open spot. Uh, clue, this is all open spots can only hope to be. Like, that's, that's how you are. You just, you just, I want to get on stage for some reason. And um, I think I had a different, I definitely had a different uh, idea of myself before I did stand up. I thought I was a lot more kind of cool. And I thought that, uh, I thought I was a great, fun, cool lad. And when you started, um, you were a bit more um, smiley and, and. Oh, uh, yeah, I was yeah. quite affable. Yeah. Because I was, um, I was trying to be, I thought I had to be as a comic. I thought you've got to go on and be like, hey guys, this gig's great, you're great, good to see you all, hey man, I love this, love your jumper, and all this. And, um, and just describe me there, mate. Yeah, 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 but I think you mean it, that's the, po that's the point, is that it's not like, <laughs> it's, it's not a case of a, you know, that comedy's bad, it's just like, that wasn't who I was. So Were you copying someone then? Was it so I think I probably I really love Ross Noble and like he right. had, does have this you know just genuine warmth towards yeah. the audience, likes them and uh, enthusiasm for them and their lives and I don't care about <laughs> 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 their lives. Um, I care about where their lives overlap with mine and how it's similar. That's what I want to share with them. Um, but like uh, yeah, so that I, I kind of I I think I had to make a decision early on to be me and to figure out what that was and uh, yeah and, and kind of impose a few rules on myself because I was trying to be like comics that weren't me so I was trying to like I think I kind of had a I do you know I do swear in my stand up and that sounds like I'm trying to be a tough guy but uh, I but I had a rule early on which was like don't swear and this it's like absolutely the perfect word to use in that sentence and uh, and also don't <laughs> I had to impose this all on myself, was that if you do improv or riff on something, you have to make it not shock comedy. Because early on, 
when I started doing stand-up, everyone was um, mainly watching kind of like, you know, the really big comics at the time were Ricky Gervais and uh, Frankie Boyle and people like that who were really, you know, like, yeah, Frankie Boyle was just so good at doing that kind of stuff. But then, if you're not Frankie, if you're not that person, it doesn't suit you to say those things. The only reason it kind of, we, we accept it from him is because it seems to make sense to come out of his mouth. It's very, but, easy, it's very easy to get that style wrong, isn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have got that style wrong, and then, uh, and then instead of going, oh, I probably got that style wrong, I'll go away and work on it, they go, what, everyone's getting offended? Oh, sorry, guys, I guess I'm too offensive for everyone. It's just a joke, guys, learn to see what a joke is. And you're like, the problem with this is this, there wasn't a good joke. <laughs> so all we're left with is the offensive bit. <laughs> so that is why we're reacting to that. Because all you've left us with, but the good offensive jokes are, just, are, are like, that was so funny, I laughed in spite of myself. Because you made it so funny, and that's kind of the joy of it. Uh, and yeah, when people just write the jokes that is like, <laughs> all it is, is saying that, that they, a lot of people don't realise, and I definitely didn't realise it when I started stand-up, is that simply the idea of paedophilia, AIDS, rape, whatever, is not funny on its own. That's why those things are awful things in life. <laughs> like, the reason why they're so harrowing and awful and it upsets us is because they're on their own, they're horrific to look at. And so, if you're gonna joke about them, you have to A, do a really good joke. You have to write a really good joke, really well structured, funny. It's got to be quite an original thought as well in order to make people laugh because it, it's really have to surprise them with it. And also, you know, you, you do have to, it has to be very clear where you're coming from. You could do a, you know, sometimes people, people talk a lot about with that, with the, the punching down thing. Mm. And it's like, a lot of the time it is because like, yeah, your persona doesn't work punching down on people who aren't as, you know, well off as you. So that this doesn't, doesn't add up, so it just feels nasty. Mm. And, and um, I definitely, when I started out, you know, if I, if I was like, I, if I got a heckler or something, because I, I saw Daniel Kitson call a guy a cunt early on when, when he heckled, and it was funny and everyone loved it. So I was like, that's how you deal with hecklers? <laughs> <laughs> so like... So you're going to a bad experience, you said, did you have one then? Oh, multiple. Right. I've lost count, Matt. I can't really isolate one and tell you, but like, you know, I call people with cunts, paedophiles, for no reason. That guy's probably a paedophile, and straight into that. Right. Awful things that I'd never stand by, that I'd never laugh at myself, you know, like, just because just I thought, oh, this is what can be, you know, I'm scared, I'm an so like, open yeah. spot on stage. It's a natural reaction, isn't it? Yeah. So you're off the mail the room a bit as well, because as soon as something's yeah. going to go, your back gets up and you forget that it's comedy. Yeah, you forget this comedy, and you just, oh, I've got to do this. Yeah. And so I just do it without, like, knowing that, you know, uh, that is not what you're supposed to do. And I, so I had a rule early on, which was, you're not allowed to say any of that stuff. Right. Even if, it, even if you're, Improv, even if it dies and it isn't funny, you have to just deal with that, and that will, in time you will get better, yeah. uh, and you'll be able to think a bit differently on the spot. I can imagine when you first started though, you and this this is it met in a very nice way, mm. but you were very hecklable. Oh yeah, still am. Yeah, because you're very different, aren't you? That's the thing. And, and you just look like I mean, the main people who heckle me, uh, you know, guys who are they usually, well, proper lads, probably you know. Bloke blokes, geezers. Ge geezers, who uh, definitely punched someone in the past, and, you know, and, and like <laughs> tough guys in a group, or like middle-aged guys who aren't tough but still look at me and like, I'm not taking this shit. This guy. Like, why am I listening to this guy? <laughs> like, because it, 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 also because I don't present myself with this like, I'm in charge of the room. This is my house, you know right. that. So they're like looking at me like, why? You know why? Why am I listening to this? this guy? Doesn't know what he's doing. So sometimes, if they, if they don't get it, which you know, with any comedy, you cannot get. It. It's just you know, your own personal sense of humour. But if they don't get it, they think he's doing this wrong because he's not. I'm not owning it. Like this is definitely. I'm definitely doing this right. By the way, everybody. Yeah. Like you know, it only really works and is fun if it's like you know. There's that fragile kind of balance of like you know, it's people tr trusting it. And uh, so I get heckled. At, all the time, still by um, I I had an experience recently. I basically had to leave the stage because I was about to cry. Oh, <laughs> and it was like uh, it was like um, when was it? Like last month. Yeah. What was it, Kate? Do you remember? 
Yeah, yeah. it was in Winchester. Right. In a fucking, in a theatre. Like, it was like a really <sighs> nice venue, nice gig. Very nice audience. Went really well. Like, it's, cause they were nice for everyone. Like, everyone had, like, you know, gone on. Charlie Baker was amazing. And, like, James Gill was coming. Like, this was such a great gig. And I had a nice time. Mm. And then, like, near the end, like, a guy started heckling. Pretty tough looking guy. But, like, and I was, I, so I, did, I did a bit that I've got about how those are always the people who heckle me. Just a bit about what their inner monologue is like when they see me. And when they're, you know, I used to bully this guy in school. What the hell am I laughing at him for? Like, I'm getting angry about it. And I'm, and I'm like, I've got to, got to write the balance and get him, start bullying him again. And then a guy behind him. So the guy who I was saying that about was fine with it and laughing and it was all good fun and it was fine. The guy behind him, and I haven't seen this in a long time, done like at face value, just did the wanker sign at me. But proper like that. I was like, wow, that's pretty. So obviously I'm going straight into that because I can't just ignore that and carry on because it's hilarious to me that he's done it. <laughs> I was quick did the wanker sign and, and uh, thinking that he would be like, yeah, ha, ha, yeah, and he was very deadly serious. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, you're actually angry, aren't you? Like, well, look, mate, I expected, look, if I, if I wanted to see this, what you've just done tonight, I'd stay at home and watch more of the week. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I've done stand up comedy for 40 minutes. <laughs> and more of the week. You know there's not like a panel here. There's not like <laughs> Dar is not there, there's not What was he angry and, about? And he said he said, No, I'm just saying, if I want to see this type of humour, I'd watch Mock the Week. I was like, so you've come to see a comic who's on Mock the Week. <laughs> you are angry that his humour is the kind of humour you'd see on Mock the Week. <laughs> is that what's happened here? <laughs> He went, he went, no, I just would have thought you would have come up with some new material by now. No, I've just done 40 minutes of new material. It's not been on TV. Right. So I said, no, this has never been on TV. This is all new. He went, no, I mean, a different style. You'd have done something different. This is all the same vein of what you've done in the past. Okay, so I was like, oh, yeah, establish again. <laughs> you see me on TV, is that right? He went, yeah. He went, and I, and I liked you on TV as well. I was like, right, so... You liked it on TV. It was your kind of humour that made you laugh. Went, yeah. So then you went, I'll go and see that guy live. Went, yeah. And then I came out and did a material you've never heard before, but it is the same sense of humour and you hate it now. <laughs> he said, yeah. I wanted, to, I wanted to do something different. I was like, oh, I don't think that's how it went. And it was really fun. Just like, it was just messing around. And, it was, and also I kind of had to like, I was really focusing on don't get angry at him. Because yeah. he was being very obnoxious, quite aggressive. Um, also, he was saying stuff just to upset me. So there was a point where like, he, was, he was just going, yeah, I liked you before, but I think you're weak now, I don't like it. And he was deliberately trying to upset me, because it was like, I don't know why, something had gone on in his day, but, like, but I was just being like, right, if you get angry at this guy, the whole gig's ruined. So you just got to joke around. So I was like, really putting loads of energy into just like, finding him funny and keeping everyone laughing with it. And then I went, so I did the gig, said good night, went, and I was like, oh, like okay, and I had a lot of adrenaline in me. I was like, right, you did it. You didn't have a go at him. Well done for not having a go at him. You can just go home now. And, uh, and then, I basically, I don't know how it happened, but I think there was a sympathy encore from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> They were like, he, well, he had a really tough time there, so he probably wants to do more. <laughs> and, um, it's interesting about, because uh, uh, well, Andy Parsons, who was on Mock the Week, yeah. and, uh, he told me, I think he turned it into a routine again, but he said he had someone on his show that was just staring at him from the front row. We didn't laugh once throughout the whole of the show, and he said to me, you haven't laughed once, have you not enjoyed it? And he said, no, I, I don't really like you. I said, well, well, why did you come? Because I've seen you on the telly. Yep. I said, all right. I said, do you like me on telly? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolute classic. We're performing to a bunch of pictures, mate. <laughs> um, except, um, except here, they're lovely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of went on again. And then obviously I made a joke about how, because he was still there. So I made a joke about how... I mean, you knew it was going to be me again, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping that I'd do something different again. And then I like, did a 
you know, silly routine, pretending to be like a different kind of comic. And, but then I just kind of went, ah, I can't pull it off, mate. I can, I can only be myself, really. And then I thought, I thought, well, what would be funny is if you apologise to him really sincerely. That'll be funny, because that's the opposite. Because I was kind of trying to deliberately do the opposite of, um, of, of having a go at him. So I thought, if you apologise, that's so funny <laughs> in my head. So <laughs> I went up to him and I, I was like, no, nah, listen, mate, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say genuinely, you know, I do work really hard at this and I appreciate, you know, you've come along, you really like me on TV and it must be really annoying for you and gutting and, and I really don't want to disappoint you and I feel like I have and I've let you down tonight. And as I'm saying it, I realise my brain, oh shit, this is actually how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> when you get heckled, it's not... <laughs> when you get heckled, you don't go, you're wrong, I'm great. I go, you're right, I'm shit. Right. And so I'm saying out loud to him, I'm sorry, and I really work hard on this, and I feel like I've let you down, and my body's like, you do feel like this, and then my brain goes, better cry then. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done a therapy trick on yourself. Because <laughs> you better start. So my voice starts going, and they can hear, it's like 400 of them. And my voice is shaking. And I kind of get to the end of it, and it's a hush whisper, uh, kind of, I'm in a whisper at that point, it's going, oh, I'm really sorry, mate. <laughs> and then I just have to put the mic on and just fucking leg it. It's like, get off the stage before you start crying if you cry. Uh, but also, as I was saying it, even he was looking at me going, oh, mate, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I realise mean, I've gone too far here. Yeah, um, but, like, yeah, I still can't really, like, um, like, I still get heckled a lot, and I still, I still definitely always think, yeah, I'm shit when it happens. And like any heckler who goes to see a comedian and, and like shouts out, you know, you ask that. Like, one of my favourite jokes early on was seeing Brian Gittins do a joke where he went, because uh, uh, a lot of comics would have jokes about, got heckled the other day, and it would be a story about how someone heckles us and then we destroy him and we tell on stage in front of another audience and show them how clever and funny we are. And Brian Gittins had a joke where he went, got heckled the other night and uh, he destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I always feel. That happened, that happened here. He got, to, he got heckled here. Dude. And uh, just put his hands on his hips and went, I've got nothing, mate. I've got nothing. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> We're just going to be honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to get out of the situation. Mate, yeah. Like, oh, Such a nice way of doing it. Uh, let's talk about Mock the Week um, because you're on that quite a lot. So yeah. We work on that together. I say we work on it together. I, yeah. do, I do a warm up and say hello to you yeah. in the green room. And that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Don't say hello back. <laughs> This does. Yeah, this does. <laughs> nice. Well, thank um, So, because I wouldn't have put you down, really, as someone to, to do Mock the Week, because mm -hmm. it's obviously a topical show that you've got to write topical jokes and stuff like that. How do you approach that, then? Because that must be very different for you. Yeah, uh, of all panel shows, it's just... Um, I, in the early days, I'd do tryouts for stuff like 8 out of 10 cats, you have to do tryouts for. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I would try and be an 8 out of 10 cats comedian. So right. I'd, I'd try and write the kind of jokes I'd seen on 8 out of 10 cats, and I didn't ever get on the show with that approach, because you're basically racing to do the same joke as everybody else, um, and just like hoping that you've written a slightly better version of that joke than, than other people. Um, and it, it was it just wasn't working for me. And I was like, why, why are you doing that? Because like, you tried really hard to make sure like you're different to other, you're not the same as you know another comedian on the bill with you. You know, which, by the way, is also what most comedians do. Most comedians are trying to have their own persona that's not like everyone else. And we all do that quite well, I think, with live stand-up. But then it's very easy then when we get on TV or do a panel show to revert to just being like, oh, I better be a comedian like we were on your open spots. Oh, I better do what comedy is. So I better be a, a panel show comic and write these kind of jokes without thinking, well, I wouldn't tell these jokes on stage. Right. It wouldn't suit me. Like, and so I was like... Right, you've got to, you know, you've got to start. Right, you've got to basically take your comic persona and you just drop them into this like a sitcom character. So this is the world. The world is this is Mot the Week or is Eight Out of Ten Cats or whatever. And where does this guy fit into that as a whole? Mm -hmm. And like, who does he? Who who would he disagree with? Who would he agree with? What's everyone else going to say? Uh, you know, don't say that. Say the opposite. That's why a lot of the time I'm always there going, like, you know, saying that I like things that 
no one would like. Okay, so you're purposely going against the grain. Yes, yeah, claiming on some of So let's say, for example, like the, in the news uh, yesterday was sugar tax, was, was all the, you know, across the, the board of social media and stuff like that. So let's say that's going to be a topic on Mock the Week. Yeah. You would purposely not write stuff about sugar tax? or I'd write about it, but I'd say I thought it was great. Um, <laughs> like the sugar tax. Right, so you just just going, yeah, just saying, like, I tried to start my own sugar tax once when I was a kid. Right. Um, <laughs> in the playground, and I was like, you need some sugar, give me some money. And so I just being an idiot. Yeah. Uh, I just say how much I love the sugar tax because, like, I would think that not everyone's gonna say that they love the sugar That's tax. There'd be a lot of cri- criticism on it, and it doesn't really work for my my you know my persona, or whatever it is, you know, a uh, a unjustifiably confident idiot. And, and so, like, yeah, you know, quite self assured. That self assured, not confident, I'd say, but like, yeah, but self assured, you know, idiot. And so, like, going into it, just having the wrong opinion on it you know right. me, me, me going in and being like yeah no i'll tell you what about this it just it doesn't really doesn't work if i am saying the thing that everyone agrees with it goes no you're right it's stupid yeah because like it'd be, but when why would i realize that you know um but sometimes when you want to talk about stuff that is like you know i wanted to talk about well, well obviously for ages every show is to talk about brexit yeah and and it was like i've i'm was voting Remain and felt very passionate about it, and I didn't want to do jokes that were that could be taken the wrong way in any way because I thought it was a very important vote, and uh, I wanted to do a pro Remain bit, but I knew that I couldn't do a bit where I went on and was like seriously saying why I'm voting Remain right. and doing that, and because my persona focuses on small things rather than big things, it's that thing as well of not really being able to. That guy can't really take on the referendum and think about it in those terms. And so I did a, I wrote a routine about peppermint tea instead, <laughs> and just about having the tea bag in or out of the, of the peppermint tea. Because you know, that's more what he would do. Yeah. Is trying to understand in or out. He'd be like, well, if you leave the tea bag in, then you know the cup of tea as a whole is stronger and the tea bag itself gets weaker. But if you take the tea bag out, the cup of tea as a whole is weaker and the tea bag goes directly in the bin. And like it was that as a thing instead to kind of like get that get that point of view across, but in, in through the lens of that uh, weirdo who can only obsess over small minutiae. It's interesting. You're referring to your act or you in the third person there. He would. Yeah, it's very pretentious, and I don't like no, doing no, it. No, but no, like, no, it's, no, uh, it's no, no, no. what I meant was, is that how you see it? Then is it a character to you? No, uh, not so. I don't. I don't really think about it too much. But like, I think um, it. It helps to remove yourself from it to some degree so that you don't become... Because obviously, whatever you are on stage, whoever you are as a comic, you're not exactly you. You're often an exaggerated version of yourself or you know, or even like a played-down version or whatever it is. And if you start to believe that that's who you are, I think it can like get a bit weird in your actual life. And it has, it's quite good to separate that. Mm. Just be like, you know, I'm only, especially when you're writing routines like that, I have to be like, I'm just writing this routine about a small little silly thing because that's what suits the character. But I can't be like, and that's what I genuinely think about Brexit. Right. Is that I see it all through peppermint tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, so I have to kind of go, that's that thing. Yeah. And then my own life is like a much more complicated mess. Gotcha. And I'm a, a, I'm a less clearly defined person, you know. Right. Is, so it's not really quite gruelling to do. Cause it's a lot, it's like two and a half hours with a record, isn't it? two to three hours. It's fun. I've really enjoyed it every time. I don't. I tend to go back and do shows I don't enjoy, right. and uh, I just love doing it. I was very lucky that from day one, my friends were on it, mm-hmm. and there were people that I enjoyed being on it with. So I, I, my first one, Josh uh, and Pasco were both on it, mm-hmm. and uh, they're people who I started out with, really good mates. I know they're not gonna, you know, the, the old um, kind of uh, the way people used to see Mock the Week or talk about Mock the Week, and I've never experienced this was everyone shouts over one another, it's competitive, it's an mm. alpha male environment, and, uh, and it was horrible and stressful. And I can say that on this show because they are aware that that is the image that got put out about them, because it got said so much, it looped back, and the people who made the show heard it, and it's quite refreshing that they genuinely went, okay, well, we're going to stop that. Yeah, you know, and they, they, they delivered, you know, most places would kind of go, who cares, we're one of the biggest panel shows on TV, if you... A bunch of whips and can't take it, <laughs> you know. But like, they were like, right, well, we've got to stop that. And Dara is an excellent host, was really aware of it. So, like, you know, by the time I did it, if anyone did speak over someone, 
who literally, if, if the person who's speaking hasn't spoken in a while and is getting in, he would just put his hand up to the person right. who was right. trying to talk over them and do that, and just be like, you know, stop talking, yeah, and, yeah. And, and then, you know, the audience in the studio sees that, you go, oh, well, don't want that to happen again. Probably won't talk over anyone anymore. Yeah. And uh, but it just works so much better. It's just such a great. I, I've you know, it's the only panel show I've done where sometimes because on any recording, sometimes the audience aren't into it. Yeah. Sometimes they're really up for it, they love Mother Week, they can't wait, it's a fun a recording, it flies by. Sometimes they're, they're not that up for it, they're not very big laughers, or they don't really care about the news stories we're talking about that week, and they're quite quiet, and yet we've still had a lot of fun. Yeah. I've not had that on any other panel show where <laughs> it, it, if the audience are hating it, yeah. normally if the audience are hating it, you all lose confidence, yeah. and you all like you don't back each other up, you throw stuff out there and everyone just watches it die and then the next person speaks. Yeah. And you're like, oh, no one's got my back here, this is horrible. But on Mock, one of the great things is that I know whatever I say, someone is going to throw the ball back. Yeah. No matter what the audience do, I've never said anything on Mock the Week and had everyone go, and then move on. <laughs> <laughs> like, no matter how stupid it is, like, and like, you know, Dark, and Dark is the best for it. Like, you know, so many people will like say jokes that didn't quite work, but he sees what they were trying to do with it, and so he tries to run with the idea with yeah, them yeah, yeah. and make it clear to the audience what it is. And sometimes they make it in the show, even though the audience in the room wasn't liking it, and they make it in the show because it is funny, and then the audience at home are tweeting about it. It's my favourite joke in the show. You're going, yeah, well, the audience in the room thought it was a part of the shit. But, like, <laughs> but we all enjoyed it and we all went with it. Yeah, so yeah. like, I, I, always, I always enjoy doing it. Oh, so what's your, because you're doing quite a lot, so what's your favourite show to do then? That one, Mock's up, you know, yeah. is, is the one I've done the most. It's the one that I feel most at home at. Um, yeah. I love doing What I Lie to You. That's it's a really, really fun, really fun show. It's exactly as it seems on TV. But there's no prep at all, you just turn up. No prep, you know, but obviously for, for your truths, you have to tell them, right. but then you don't know what one, you've told them loads of stuff, Yeah. so you don't know what ones they're going to use. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's just, it's just exactly as it comes across, Every, the three of those guys get on really well, they're really supportive to people, you know, it's my first time ever on it, I hadn't met uh, David or Rob before, um, I knew Lee and got with me anyway, but like, they were just all very supportive to me and made me feel like, you know, you can do this, this is going to be fun. And it was, it was just amazing. It's the one that I've watched the most as well. I yeah. kind of just watch it all the time. So like, I just did feel like going on in, in the TV. Yeah. <laughs> and it, was, it was great fun, I loved it. Um, can we talk about Conan? Yeah. Is that all right? Because I'm obsessed with that pro, I love Conan. I oh think, yeah? Yeah, I think it's incredible. That. And I think his monologues are the strongest of all the American chat shows. Yeah, really. yeah. And uh, was that, is he a nice bloke, first of all? Lovely bloke, I, I only, I literally only met him for the amount of time that I'm with him on screen. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't meet him before. Yeah. I went out, having not met him, did my stand-up bit, and then he comes up behind you and goes, well done. Then you sit down with him, and there's an ad break where he talks to you, and he's very, very nice. Yeah. And then he comes back and he says, see, that's, what, that's our show, see you later. And then he walks away, and then I was like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, oh, well, he's a busy, busy guy. Yeah. Um, but he was super nice, just chatting to me about Edinburgh and saying that he wants oh, to wow. go to the Edinburgh Festival and stuff. He was drumming on the table with some of a bio roast, a normal fan. <laughs> <laughs> was it fun to do? Fun show to do? Uh, no. Uh, but, uh, why, um, why was it not fun? It's, it, it's been fun for so many people. So there's so many people who absolutely loved it. So it's not, this is not a reflection on the show. Also, the people who make the show are amazingly hospitable and really nice and just really supportive and it's great. But if you watch the clip of me online, you will not disagree I am getting very little from the audience. <laughs> so, like, the audience didn't, weren't going with it. They didn't really like it. Um, Did you run the stuff in, in clubs in America before you went on it? Yes. Right, and it uh, worked in the clubs? Oh, yeah. I, 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 had, I had a gig the night before <laughs> in a club where I think it's the best that material has ever gone. Really? And I was like, I can't wait to become famous tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I just did the best gig ever. I must do it that again on TV. So, um, so yeah. It, it had, basically, this audience anyway weren't. In my defence, they weren't going for much for the whole record. Right. So everyone had told me this this audience warm up. They said, "Ah, oh, he's best in the bits." And I was like, "We well, haven't met Matt Brown." Yeah. But, uh, but, like, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, this guy's amazing. And this guy went out, and he was doing all the right things. He was, but they weren't really going for it. And I was like. 
this is weird. I, was, I said to the producer who was next to me, I said, this seems strange. And he, and he, and he was like, don't worry, when Cody comes out and does his monologue, it's going to be great. They always pick up there. We kind of come out and did this monologue, and as you say, amazing monologue. And they're not really laughing loud for that. And then the producer kind of slowly turned to me, just going, oh, that's not like, well, that's a bad sign if you're doing that. You'll hear it every single record. Um, I was like, okay, well, they're not going with Cody. The reason they're there. The reason they're here, and American. Um, and then, so then I went on, and it was quite good that I'd seen it go like that because I was like, right, this is going to be hard. So prepare yourself for a hard gig. So it's why if you do watch the clip, at no point do I look surprised. At no point do you see in my eyes like, what the, oh, I didn't expect this. I'm like, yep. And you've never seen someone stick to their guns as much as that clip. <laughs> so I went on, they weren't really going for it. I just kind of soldiered on, did it. Uh, which like, also, the reaction online was very nice, and that was a relief, but I was so depressed when I came off of it. Yeah. Like, I came off and was like... As I said, this, this was last year, in the year of, of bad, bad things. So it wasn't a good year anyway. And uh, I went there, did that, and I guess it was like, also, I put my hopes too much on things last year. So because I was quite uh, down all the time, if I, when I did something like that, an opportunity like that, I was like, OK, this is going to be a highlight, this will pick you up. And then you go out and just die, and it's the biggest show you've ever done, and you come off and it's just like, pff, you're just like, just deflated. And then I, uh, I then went from there to a steakhouse and shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that happened. And uh, that's, uh, that's right. that's actually, no, I literally shit my pants. Oh, right. yeah. uh, <laughs> I had food poisoning. And, um, I was in the toilet when it happened, but doing a wee. So, <laughs> sabotage myself. But, um, yeah, um, I'm going to start doing material if I can not talk about this, but it's, like, it's, all, it's all in the new show. I've got a whole shit myself routine because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't usually do that and it's been quite fun to talk about it. But, um, but I remember just sitting, my agent was with me, he was sitting at the table and I still stayed, like I got, I got changed, I had a complete change of clothes in my bag and like loads of wet wipes for after the show for the makeup, which is pretty lucky. So. Uh, <laughs> But I came out and said to him, like, we gotta go over shit myself. Because <laughs> I'm, you know... I was 32 at the time, and you learn how to just deal with that situation. You, know? you try and style it out and go home, and act like everything's fine, you just go, I've shit my pants. <laughs> but, um... He kind of convinced me to stay. Because he really wanted to eat at this steakhouse. And I didn't... I ordered... And then it came along, I was like, I'm not fucking eating this. I like, can't. And I was sitting there, and I was just... This sad monologue just going on to him going, I think I need to stop doing comedy, because I... None of it's making me happy. I feel unhappy all of the time. I think I just need to stop and do something else. Like, this was meant to be a really fun thing. I come all the way... I'm currently in LA, and I just hate everything, and I'm not enjoying it. That's not good, is it? I need to stop. He needs to eat it. <laughs> full steak with, like, five sides. And Creep corn. Um, and going, no, mate, like, loads of people really like you. And, and I, I was like, yeah, it's really hard to explain to him or to anyone just going, that doesn't mean anything. Right. That's not why I've done this. At any point, I've never done this so people will like me. I'm never doing it to try to be liked. Doing it because I love watching stand up. I, I, even, even when I am having a year, year like last year, the thing that I get enjoyment out of his working on and improving a stand-up show and doing those tour shows and um, you know making them better, um, and that was like that's why I do it. Mm. And no, no, and you just realise my own opinion in my own work is the only thing that matters to me. Right. And other people telling me it's good just doesn't unless unless I like it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, I can I come off of that Conan show and I've performed to nothing, and everyone who's very supportive and nice is telling you it was great, it was great. And you're like, I know that wasn't right. right. <laughs> and then it goes on YouTube and everyone's like. This audience is not even laughing, laughing at this guy. You go, see, I told you. <laughs> like I know when it's bad. I know, I know when it. I know how things have gone, and um, and yeah, I think mean, unless, but it was it's a useful year because yeah. it it does make you dwell on it and go. The only thing that matters is me enjoying it, and I'm not going to do things that I don't want to do. I'm not going to do things I don't enjoy, and uh, I'm going to surround myself by people who 
uh, who get it as well. So mm. like, you know, the, the crew who filmed that special, those specials are completely on the same page as me creatively. The people who put my tours now are the same, my tour managers, my eight money agents are. And it's just like doing that with people who uh, also have the same priorities as you um, in terms of your own well-being and your career um, has just made it so much uh, so much better. And I think that applies to anyone's job, really. But it's, it's hard to kind of like eventually break through and see that. Well, for what it's worth, I think you're one of the best we've got, mate, to be honest with Thank you. Thank you, man. That's true. I remember seeing you for the first time, too. We were doing a Muse Moose. And i would not seen you before, but somebody said you, how good you were. And you, do, you started doing some stuff about the size of a cheese grater. <laughs> and I thought, fucking, finally. Someone's <laughs> dressing the Those cheese grater. Those guys ever been silly ones. <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure. Um, has anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask James? Just put your hand up. I thought that might happen. <laughs> but, uh, all right, fair enough. Um, I I yeah, go on. Okay, we'll go. So we've got a couple. Yeah, go so on. So, like, you know, in your writing routine, there's a lot of recall. Hang on, hang on, because if we need to get this on the uh, on the podcast, oh, so we're just coming. I wish I had it. No worries, man. Hello. Hello. What's your name? Chris. Hey, Chris. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering if you, when you do a routine, you have a lot of recall, um, kind of recalling back to like yeah. the secret agent, the, the undercover cop bit. Yeah. Like obviously you talked about that, but generally, do you kind of plot in? how that recall's gonna happen, or does it come quite organically when you're writing a routine? Do you sort of think, ah, this is when I can reference back to the... Yeah, it's more that, it's, it's more that it kind of like, happens on its own, and then you see that you can do it, and then you build it in like that. Um, sometimes, I guess, sometimes it's been more deliberate. So it's, it just depends on it. I think most of them, it just naturally happens. So like, you've got a routine, and like, later on, you know, you're writing a whole different bit, and you see a link there, and then you just have to make the call as to whether it's worth doing the callback or not. You do too many that kind of like, sometimes there are callbacks where you call back to the bit. I like it to preferably to call back to it and it adds another layer onto both routines and it fleshes out the whole world a little bit more rather than just saying the same thing you said earlier. And then people going, yeah, that matches. And laughing because of that. But like, you know, it's trying to kind of pick which ones to do. But then... Sometimes, like, I had a bit where I was saying about um, mentioning people's race in a story when it's not relevant, it's very distracting. So when people are telling a story and going, like, I was in the pub and these two Chinese guys walked in, and you're just like, I hope that's relevant. And if, <laughs> and, if, and, if, and if it isn't, you know, it's like you're left feeling a bit weird at the end of the story. And, and my routine, you know, was saying that, you know, I never mention people's race during a story and that I keep it to the end as a twist. And, um, and then, like, when I wrote that routine, I was like, and clearly, later on, I will tell a story, and at the end, I'll reveal their race. So, like, you know, I kind of knew that I was going to do that ahead of time. So that was, like, one where, yeah, I was like, I'll try and put that in later on. Um, Have you ever done a callback to a bit that you haven't done? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, yeah, don't call back to bits that I forgot to do. And then, uh, it was, it, well, weirdly, it will sometimes still get a laugh, and you're like, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Shouldn't make any sense to you. <laughs> so if somebody else put a hand, yeah, go on. Yeah, I'll just come over to you. Hang on. Hi. Um, I liked your bit with the stylophone in your Netflix. Oh, thank you. I wondered if you can do any more music in your new set. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think it will just like it will kind of come about naturally if it does. Like I, I used to do a lot of music before before I was a stand up. That's what I did all the time. Just play music with my friends, and. Uh, I've never, well, as soon as I started comedy, people who knew me anyway, my friends, were saying like, oh, you're gonna do songs because that's all I've done in my life until that point. And I've never done them because it's never been like, that's the best version of that joke. Like, if, if the best version of the joke is a song, I'll do it, but if a better version is like talking or, like, so I, I, I only, only ever use props if that's the best version of the joke. If we do it without the prop and it's funnier, I'll do that. But if the funniest version is that I have to show them what I'm talking about, uh, then I always have the prop in there. So that bit was just like, it it would just be funny <laughs> to from out of nowhere to start playing that song. And so uh, I just kind of started experimenting with it, it keeps on doing that. But um, I wouldn't rule it out for other stuff. I think like if at some point there's a routine where the funniest thing to do is to have some music involved and play, play an instrument on stage, then um, I'll definitely do it again. But I'm not planning on doing it. 
Like, that's why I haven't got something like, oh, next show I better do some music or anything like that. But like, yeah, it'll probably happen again at some point. Excellent. Okay, well, we've got one more, one more question. Yeah, come on, I'll just come to you again two minutes. We'll, we'll edit this bit out of the walk-in. We won't. I can't be asked. Quite enjoy the, <laughs> quite enjoy the audience question. I understand there's only one more. <laughs> Is your nemesis still hiding cabbage in your bedroom? Very good question. Very good question. <laughs> What's that a reference to, first of all? Yeah, so that's a reference to uh, uh, a story that's like, I put on the Josh Whittaker podcast and then my book, and then I told him I want to lie to you as well. So it's, a lot more people know about it than it's ideal at this point. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, about a, uh, a child. Da- you know David Trent? Yep. Yeah, so his son, who was nine at the time, right. put cabbage leaves in my bed when I was staying over and told me I'd been cabbaged. And then um, it turns out that being cabbaged means that they continue to put cabbages in your life <laughs> until you do the same to them and then you've stopped it. And that was kind of like the the game that Mick invented. Uh, he, since I cabbaged him back, he has not cabbaged me again. He's honoured the rules. They're his rules after all. If, they, if he broke them, there's all anarchy would break loose in the cabbaging world. So uh, he's not cabbaged me again. Um, How much did you spend on cabbages for that last? That last one I spent over £150. <laughs> yeah. uh, no regrets. Is there any more questions? Anyone else want to ask questions? Yeah, go on. Uh, you had to be further away, didn't you, mate? Well, let's just pass that back, all right? Some people do still cabbage me, and uh, I ignore it because I don't want to encourage it anymore. Because I, 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 I got a cabbage sent backstage to me at a gig, and then when I was on my way out, uh, this audience member was hanging around. She went, uh, anything, uh, you find anything in your dressing room? I went, oh. <laughs> Carried on on my way. Hey man, you like know, when you were on Mock the Week and you did a bit, it was um, like unlikely uh, children's test questions. Oh, you did no, a bit about Winston saying. Churchill. Yeah. I was wondering if you actually had a third one or is it supposed to just end Yeah, up? I did have a third one. That was one where I couldn't finish it because I kept laughing. So I, it was. Um, did have a third. Now the thing is with them is that you don't. I I think some people sometimes test them out, but like I I don't. I haven't said them before I do it. Like, I've written them, like, we write it in advance. Let's all know that we do that, okay? <laughs> Let's all accept that that's what happens. We get it on a Friday and record on a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, we, we already, you write loads in advance and some of them work. But for me, the first time I've said them out loud in front of an audience is on the show. And so I don't know. Sometimes I misjudge what the funny bit is, <laughs> or what I'm going to find funny, or whatever. And also, a lot of the time, you write to amuse your fellow panelists. And I knew John Robbins was on that one. He's my friend, and I knew I know certain words and certain language that will make him laugh. So the test question was: um, I, I said, which of these is the famous Winston Churchill quote? A, we will find them on the beaches. B, goddamn, I love these peaches. <laughs> and then C was going to be, man, I love smoking cigars. That was all it was going to be. And uh, I didn't know if it would even be funny or whatever, but like, I said, goddamn, I love these peaches. And Robin's went, ha, like that. And then I'd lost it and laughed. <laughs> so I did write it to make him laugh. I knew that goddamn, I love these peaches would make Robin's laugh. So that's why I'd written it. <laughs> So I, when I said it and he laughed, I was delighted and I laughed at it. I was like, oh, I'll just do it again. And I, I tried so many times to do it and kept on laughing. And the annoying thing is, is that I did do the finished version. On the night, I did the full version with the punchline and the audience applauded because I got to the end of it. <laughs> and then the people who edit the show just kept in the times I messed up. <laughs> Didn't put the final version in. So still to this day, I get tweets on a weekly basis, I've got to know what C was! And it's like, I, just, I think Mop the Week should have someone who is employed to answer that tweet. Because <laughs> it's their fault, is the, the answer isn't out there. Just get to listen to this, so find out. Any, anyone else got another question? Hey man. It seems like there's an intentional colour palette, especially on the Netflix show. Yes. But that seems like part of the character. When did that become interpreted, or like part of yeah. your show and your character? Um, it was the... Uh, 2014 show that I did, which is the first one on the Netflix one, so the, the green one, with the autumn. So I, I kind of, before that, I, I would, uh, had a, a bit of a uniform, a comedy uniform. So when, when I started stand up, I just, I didn't really dress a particular way. And then I found that if I did gigs where I was wearing like a jumper and some slacks, like I'm wearing right now, uh, <laughs> that that was like, that was funnier. 
And so, because I didn't have much money uh, then, I just kind of went out and bought loads of jumpers, loads of polo shirts and loads of slacks. And that was my whole wardrobe. So it wasn't even like just on stage. I had no choice. I had to wear them all the time because I didn't have any other clothes. And so I was wearing these all the time. And I did three Edinburgh shows with that uniform. And then after the third one, I had the breakup that the fourth show is about. I had that breakup. And like I was saying earlier, I had the whole thing of the identity crisis of who I am and looking at really overanalyzing myself, blaming myself a lot for the relationship and the breakup. And doing what a lot of people do at the end of the break is where you kind of go, I'm going to change everything about me. And I was like, I'm going to stop dressing like this. I hate this. So I was like, <laughs> but then I kind of accidentally got another uniform. But it was like just thinking about what colours look good on me. And at the time I was like, autumnal colours look good. You wear autumnal stuff. And so for that first show, that 2014 show, um, I kind of wanted a uniform that was just for that show and not for all my gigs. So I could go around the country doing gigs and dress how I wanted, but when I did that show, I'd wear dark green cords, a dark green ja uh, jacket, and uh, this uh, plaid shirt. And um, so that's, the, that's how I'm dressing for this one. And then so for the, and then the second show, in the Netflix one, um, I think I just, I had a joke about wearing a paisley tie, uh, and so I thought, well, I'll buy a paisley tie for the show, I'll wear it. And the only one I could find was this, um, this uh, like maroon, like yeah, like autumnal maroon with like golden uh, pattern on it. And I was like, well, that fits with the colours. I'll wear, I'll get that, and I'll wear it with like. And then, and then it just became funny. So I, I just wear it at any gig that I did because I, I had to do the paisley paisley makes girls go crazy joke. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I would wear it for that joke, but with any shirt that I had on which are a bunch of different types of you know, colours of shirt, but it was always funniest when I wore it with another maroon shirt. When I was wearing a maroon tie with a maroon shirt, it was funnier because it's a bit odd. And then I was just started being like, well, for the show, I'll wear maroon cords as well, and I'll just go full maroon for it. <laughs> um, and then in Edinburgh, the room I was in was a bit too big for me. Like the, the, the stage was too big, and it felt quite empty. And so in the first week of the Fringe, I was like, can we order a curtain just to, like, can we get a curtain just to cut in half. They said, what colour do you want the curtain? They like, maroon. <laughs> I thought that would be funny, you know, really overly maroon, the whole thing. And, uh, and also there was a bit in that show where I took apart the mic stand and I threw everything around on the floor and my agents rightfully were like, venues aren't gonna be okay with you doing that with their equipment every night. You might wanna buy your own mic stand and mic lead. I was like, okay, well if I'm doing that, I might as well get them custom made and get them maroon. <laughs> I'm buying them anyway. So I kind of did that and had that. So then, then it was more deliberate for the third show. It was like, okay, I'll do this. And it'll be like uh, an autumnal yellow, kind of yellows and browns for that one. And so all of that was very, uh, yeah, it was, became deliberate. You know, well, as with anything, I think, it's accidental. So first of all, it starts with like a genuine thing in your life where you go, I hate how I look. And so you start dressing differently. And then it's an accidental thing of like, oh, I've just discovered that this is funny in comedy, I'm gonna keep doing it. And then it becomes deliberate of like, right now this show is gonna be all this color. And, um, and then for the Netflix shows, because we then come up with the fourth show, and I had to decide what the color scheme was for that. And um, it was quite hard because like, autumnal green, autumnal red, and autumnal yellow looks nice. Brown <laughs> just looks a bit like, muddy and like, oh, this has got a brown set. And also doesn't really fit with the other three, but blue doesn't really suit it either. And then, um, because I was calling back to all the others, I decided I'd make it all three colours. And then because for all that show, I talked about being a lollipop man, and I talked about like uh, lollipop men doing, whose patches like right next to traffic lights sometimes. And I thought, I'll just do them in the order of the traffic lights. And that's like why, so the, the reason for why they were that colours kind of almost came afterwards of me going, that's why. And then really, I just really fan theory my whole shows and was like going back and going, okay, the reason that one's green, so there's a reason why each one of them are the colour that there are now. Uh, and it's in relation to traffic lights and stuff. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a reason why Green is green, red is red, and yellow is yellow for the shows. But no one's figured it out yet, so I'm not going to say it. And it's a really stupid reason. It's not, uh... All right, we'll do one more. Have we got one more question? No? Or should we end it there? Okay, we'll end it there. Fair enough. <laughs>
James, thank you very much uh, for coming on. Have you enjoyed yourself? I have enjoyed it. Thank Brilliant. you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Well done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, round of applause, please, Mr. James. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we are here every Monday as a comedy club as well, Monday nights, uh, so come back to that. Um, and if you don't mind, just before we go, one more round of applause for brilliant James.